Here we see the methane molecule. The center atom is the carbon atom, and it's bonded to four hydrogen atoms. Here we see another molecule that has carbon as its center atom. It is carbon dioxide. In carbon dioxide, the carbon atom is bonded to two oxygens through two double bonds. Comparing these two molecules, we see that they're very different. In methane, the carbon atom is having four single bonds. In carbon dioxide, the carbon atom has two double bonds. The nature of the binding electrons near the carbon atom in these two compounds is very different. At the same time, each of the carbon atoms has four bonds associated with it. So how do we keep track of the differences of the binding electrons in the vicinity of the carbon atom in these two cases? Well, one way in which chemists keep track of such differences is by using a parameter called the oxidation state of an atom. The oxidation state of an atom is a useful tool which can help in following differences in the contributions that the atom's electrons make to the formation of chemical bonds. For instance, here, the oxidation state of the carbon atom in methane is minus four. The oxidation state of the carbon atom in carbon dioxide is plus four. The differences in these two values reflects the differences in the nature of the bonds in these molecules. In this segment, we will learn how to determine the oxidation states of atoms. We can determine that by following a set of rules. The oxidation state of an atom in its elemental form is zero. For instance, the oxidation state of oxygen in gaseous oxygen, which is its elemental form, is zero. However, the oxidation state of an atom that is part of a compound is generally not zero. So let us have a look at the values, the kind of values of the oxidation states of atoms. Here we see part of the periodic table. And in this periodic table, the common values of the oxidation states of all the elements are indicated. For instance, the oxidation state of fluorine is minus one. The most common oxidation state of sodium is plus one. And the oxidation state of beryllium, the most common one, is plus two. We see that the value of the oxidation states of these elements is very similar to the charge of their most common ionic forms. Iron is an element that can have multiple oxidation states. The most common ones are plus three and plus two. Carbon, as we have seen, can also have multiple oxidation states. Plus four and minus four are the most common ones. Even hydrogen can have multiple oxidation states, plus one and minus one. But how do we know what the oxidation state of a particular atom is when it's part of a compound? For instance, how do we know that the oxidation state of a carbon atom is plus four or whether it is minus four? To determine this, we need a set of rules. Rule number one we have already seen. It says that the oxidation state of an atom in its elemental form equals zero. Solid carbon, gaseous oxygen, and solid iron are materials in which the atoms have oxidation state zero. Rule number two says that the oxidation state of a monoatomic ion is the same as the value of the charge of that ion. For instance, the oxidation state of barium two plus equals plus two, and the oxidation state of chlorine minus is minus one. The third rule says that the oxidation state of fluorine in a compound is minus one. So the fluorine atom in hydrofluoric acid has oxidation state minus one. Now, each of the fluorine atoms in sulfur hexafluoride also has oxidation state minus one. Rule number four says that oxygen as part of a compound has oxidation state minus two. So the oxygen in water has oxidation state minus two. And the two oxygens in nitrogen dioxide also have oxidation state minus two. Hydrogen has oxidation state plus one 
when it's part of a covalent compound. So the, both the hydrogens in water have oxidation state plus one, and the hydrogens in ammonia also have oxidation state plus one. However, when hydrogen is bonded to a metallic element, it has oxidation state minus one. Examples include magnesium hydride and sodium hydride. In addition to these rules, there are two more rules that are going to be very helpful in determining the oxidation states of atoms in compounds. The first of these rules says that the sum of the oxidation states of all the atoms in a neutral compound must be zero. And the second rule says that the sum of the oxidation states of all the atoms in a polyatomic ion must be equal to the charge of that ion. Now, let's apply this whole set of rules to a couple of examples to find out if we can determine the oxidation states of atoms that are part of compounds. The first compound that we're going to have a look at is hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is a covalent compound, and that means that the oxidation state of the hydrogen must be plus one. Now we also know that if we add up the oxidation states of all the atoms in this compound, we must find zero because this is a neutral compound. Now using this trick, we can find the oxidation state of the bromine atom. Since hydrogen is plus one, the bromine atom must have oxidation state minus one. They add up to zero. Next up is perbromic acid. And same as before, the oxidation state of the hydrogen is plus one. We also know that the oxidation state of the oxygen atoms must be minus two. To find the oxidation state of the remaining atom, bromine, we apply the same trick as before. We add up the oxidation states of all the atoms and try to solve for the unknown atom, the oxidation state of the unknown atom. We can set up the following equation. One times plus one for the hydrogen, plus four times minus two for the oxygens, plus the oxidation state of the unknown, which is the oxidation state of bromine, must equal zero. There's only one unknown in this equation, and that is the oxidation state of bromine. We can solve for this unknown and find that the oxidation state of bromine equals seven. The next compound is calcium hydride. In this compound, the hydrogen is actually bonded to a metallic element. And that means that the oxidation state of the hydrogen is minus one. There's two hydrogens. And so, if we have to make a neutral compound, that means two times minus one plus two equals zero. And that means that the oxidation state of the calcium ion in this compound must be plus two. The next example is magnesium pyrophosphate. It is an ionic compound in which the charge of the magnesium ion is two plus. And that means that the oxidation state of the magnesium ion equals plus two. We also know that the oxidation state of the oxygen atoms, again, is minus two for each of the oxygen atoms in this compound. We can use this again to determine the oxidation state of the remaining atom, which is phosphorus. So we can set up the following equation. Two times plus two for magnesium, plus seven times minus two for the oxygens, plus twice the unknown oxidation state equals zero. We can solve for the unknown and find that the oxidation state of the phosphorus atoms in this case is five. The oxygens in the next compound, which is the nitrate anion, is again minus two. Now, to find the oxidation state of the nitrogen atom, we must be very careful here, because the charge of this compound overall is minus one. So that means that we can set up the following equation. Three times minus two plus the unknown, that is the oxidation state of nitrogen, must equal minus one. We can solve again for the unknown and find that the oxidation state of nitrogen, in this case, equals five plus 
5. Finally, let's look at xenon oxytetrafluoride. Once again, the oxygen has an oxidation state of minus 2. Fluorine always has an oxidation state of minus 1 when it's part of a compound. So we can set up, once again, an equation to find the oxidation state of the unknown atom, which is the xenon atom. We find minus 2 for the oxygen plus 4 times minus 1 plus the unknown oxidation state of xenon must equal 0. This is a neutral compound. Solving for the unknown, and we find that xenon, in this case, has an oxidation state of plus 6.